Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for revelation that you're bringing forth this day. We thank you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, if you would. We are sharing with you on the subject of deliverance. We've been talking for some time on this, and we're continuing on today. Mark 16, 17. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Every believer is to cast out demons. People who are believers and aren't casting out demons. They're not doing what the Word of God says. We saw how Jesus cast out demons in all the synagogues of Galilee as he was preaching the gospel. We saw that our enemy is the devil. We saw that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and all of the stealing, killing, destruction, physically, mentally, financially, socially, emotionally, any area of your life has been a work of the devil. We also saw the fact that Satan carries out his work through evil spirits that seek to enter into a person. We saw how they come in through the open door of sin, and they come in from inheritance, our own sins and victimization, and we have a network of spirits that isn't everybody. Everybody needs deliverance. We also talked about the fact that deliverance is not for the world. It is only for Christians. It's a children's bread. It belongs to those who are Christians. Only those are the ones who have authority to cast them out, and they're the only ones that can retain their deliverance. We also talked about the fact that deliverance is for believers and how Christians can have demons. It's understanding that we are spirit, soul, and body, that God is dwelling in our spirit. That's the spirit of Christ that we get when we're born again. We receive the Holy Spirit who dwells in our spirit. Demons are dwelling in our soul and body, and they have to be cast out. They have not left just because we've been got born again. And we talked about many other things, about principles for deliverance, how we cast them out, how they come out, releasing out. They come out with a breath, releasing out, yawn, cough, sigh, burp, some release of breath coming out of us. And many other things, why we pursue deliverance, and, and many other things that we talked about in the past messages. Today, we're going to talk about answering objections to deliverance. Unfortunately, in the body of Christ, there's about 90% plus that do not believe in deliverance. Most all churches do not involve, get involved in deliverance. Denominations out there do not believe in deliverance. Even the ones that are, that are really not a denomination, but groups of Christians, even full gospel, charismatic, full God, word of faith people, all these kind of ones do not believe in deliverance, unfortunately. It is very sad. We're going to answer the objections to deliverance. First of all, we see, the first one is, of course, I don't need to cast out demons because I'm a Christian. They think that because I'm a Christian that all the, the demons are gone and no demons can be in us. That is a lie. Notice what it says here. We go back to verse 15. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So this talks about the person who has believed and he gets saved. Then what? These signs shall follow them that believe. Well, this means the guy who got born again, the believer. What's he supposed to do? In my name shall they cast out demons. Every believer is to cast out demons because they have them. They've come in, remember, from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization in life. In Matthew chapter 12, and verse 28, Jesus said, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. The kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of God, comes into manifestation in your life as you're casting out the demons. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house? A strong man is Satan. His house is the demonic network that's in us. And spoil his goods, which is what you do when you cast out all the demons. Except he first bind the strong man and then he'll spoil his house. So we bind Satan and then we begin to cast out the demons in area after area of our life. Then he makes another statement. He says, he that's not with me is against me. This is on the same context to talking about casting out demons. What does that tell you? If a person is not involved in casting out demons, they're against Jesus. Pretty clear. If you're not with me, doing what I say, you're against me. That means we've got 90% plus of the body of Christ is against Jesus because they're not doing what he said. Jesus would never tell us to cast out demons if we didn't need to. Of course we need to because we all have them in us. Another objection that we hear is people say, well, if I cast out demons like it talks about over in Mark, in chapter six, Mark chapter 16, where we saw, 
that it tells us to do it. So I, I, people will say, well, I acknowledge that we're supposed to cast them out because the Bible says. But it doesn't say I'm supposed to cast them out of me. I'm supposed to cast them out of unbelievers. That's what they say. Would we cast demons out of unbelievers? No. Why? Well, no, several reasons. Number one, they don't have a relationship with God to begin with, and they're not in covenant with him. Matthew 15, verse 26. This is where he was talking about casting the demon out of the, the, uh, the daughter, the woman who wanted the, the, the devil cast out of her daughter, and she was seeking for that. And in verse 26, in answering her, he said, It is not meet to take the children's bread, which was deliverance, which is what she sought, and cast it to the dogs. So what does that tell you? Deliverance is the children's bread. Who are those people? Those in covenant relationship with God. Those people that are born, again, in the New Testament era. In the Old Testament, it was under the Old Testament because it was under the covenant relationship. And so, this shows you the fact that deliverance is for those who are the children, who are the dogs, those outside of the covenant. So, the answer is, you, will cast, you would never cast demons out of someone who does not have a covenant with God. They don't have a right to it. It is not a right that they have in their life. Furthermore, they don't have authority to do it because unless you are in Christ, you don't have authority over the demons. You try to cast out demons and you're not in Christ, you're going to get destroyed by the enemy. Look what happened over in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 13, there were certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. They weren't born again. They were Jews. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priests, which did so. The evil spirit answered, said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Because the guy wasn't born again. He wasn't in covenant relationship with God. And what happened? He tried to cast them out, but the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Uh, they're not going to be successful at all. Uh, you do not cast them out of unbelievers. Unbelievers cannot cast them out themselves. Another thing is, if you cast demons out of unbelievers, as people will say that, were, that scripture in Mark 16, 7, or 16, 17 is referring to, what can happen to them? Could they be able to retain their deliverance? No. They would not be able to retain their deliverance. Why? Because they don't have a covenant with God, for one, and don't know the word, they wouldn't be able to resist the temptations of the enemy. They would continue to walk in the ways of sin and the flesh, which is what they walk after. And what would happen? The spirits would come back in, and they would come with seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. They would be in worse shape. Deliverance is not for unbelievers. It's amazing how many ministers today will even cast demons out of unbelievers. That's a mistake. They don't spiritually locate them first. You find out if they're born again first. Find out if they're walking right with the Lord. If they're abiding in the ways of sin, they're not even a candidate for deliverance. So deliverance is for those in covenant relationship that are going to walk in the ways of the Word of God so that they will be able to retain their deliverance. Casting out of demons out of unbelievers will actually be a disservice to them because they're going to get worse because the demons are going to be able to come back in because the demons will try to come back in once they've been cast out. Another thing that we see, objection is, Christians cannot have demons in them because we are the holy temple of the Lord. That's what people say. Well, first of all, we need to understand what are we. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This reveals that you and I are spirit, soul, and body. When you get born again, what happens? You get a new spirit. Did you get a new soul? No. Did you get a new body? Obviously not. We only got a new spirit. So, there's only been a change in one area. Well, just because the fact that we're now the temple of God, that doesn't mean that the demons can't still be in us, but that's the rationale that people have, which is error. The example, best example to show this clearly is over in Mark chapter 11, verse 15. 
when Jesus went into the temple, and you need to know this so you can explain this to others. They come to Jerusalem, Jesus went in the temple, began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the table of the money changers and the seat of them that sold doves. The Old Testament temple had three parts, holy of holies, holy place, outer court. Where was God dwelling? In the holy of holies. Was he dwelling in the holy place or outer court? No. Jesus comes in the temple, what's he find? He finds these evil inhabitants carrying on the sinful activities. Where were they? They were not outside the temple. They were in the temple. They were either in the holy place or the outer court. What does that tell you? The presence of God is in one location. The evil inhabitants carrying out their sinful activities were in one of the other locations, but all inside the same temple. That shows you the presence of God can be in one location in the temple and evil spirits and evil inhabitants in another part of the temple. What's that got to do with us? Well, where is the temple of God now? Where God dwells? It's in us. Where is he dwelling? In our spirit. Not in the soul, not in the body, in the spirit. So, that's just the same thing like in there. Can we have evil spirits that are in our soul and body? Of course. Can we sin in our soul or body? Of course. Just because we have the Holy Spirit in us doesn't mean we can't have demons in us. By that rationale, that would mean we must be in perfection. We couldn't sin, we couldn't have sickness, we couldn't have any problems. We should be in perfection by that rationale. Since, since the Holy Spirit's in us and we're the temple of God, we can't have demons, we couldn't have any evil at all. Well, of course, that is a lie. The problem that they fail to understand is the fact that spirit, soul, and body, and that we can have demons in soul or body. They're not in our spirit. They're in a different location. Just as we see here, the Holy of Holies is likened to our spirit where God dwells in us, the holy place likened to our soul, outer court likened to our physical body. The evil physical inhabitants are likened to the evil spiritual inhabitants in us that have to be cast out. And how did they get got out, got rid of, get rid of them? Did the presence of God drive the money changers out? No. Did the presence of God keep the money changers from coming in? No. How did they get driven out? Somebody came in with authority and cast them out. In like manner, the presence of God in us, does that get the evil spirits out of us? No. Does it stop them from coming in? No, not if you walk in the way of sin. You'll open the door and let them come in. And so it doesn't drive them out whatsoever. How do we get rid of them? We have to cast them out. This shows when you get born again and the presence of God comes into you, it does not drive the demons out of you. The demons are still in you. They have to be cast out. That's why the first sign following the believer is, in my name they shall cast out demons. Another thing, people say, well, you can't have any demons in you. They think, they say, there aren't any scriptures that even indicate that whatsoever. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 is very interesting. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, well, that would be something different. That would be talking about an evil spirit. The word receive is the word lambano. If you took another spirit which you've not received or another gospel which you've not accepted, you might bear well, bear well with them. Otherwise, we can receive another spirit which would be an evil spirit that would come in from something that is contrary to the ways of the Word of God. So, we are the temple of the Lord. God is dwelling us in our spirit. Demons are dwelling in our soul and in our body. Another objection that people bring up is devils cannot be in a Christian because light cannot dwell with darkness. You turn on light in the room and the darkness flees. That's their mentality. Well, it sounds like it might make some sense there. But remember, the spiritual house of God, which is what we are, we have three parts, spirit, soul, and body just as we saw in the Old Testament example where there was the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the Outer Court, different places. So, when the light comes into our spirit, that doesn't get rid of all the demons out of us whatsoever. People say, well, what about if the Word comes into us? The Word does come into our heart, and the Word comes into our mind, but it still doesn't get rid of the spirit. Spirits out of us, we have to cast out the spirits. You can have lots of demons in you even though you've heard the word. The word's coming in to renew your mind and to bring you to faith and hope so that you'll act on the word, but it does not drive the demons out of you whatsoever. It's just man just assuming that light means that darkness will leave. In Matthew chapter, Mark Matthew, that is, 
chapter 6, verse 23. Look what it says. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. It's talking about your body. So you could let it, darkness into your body even if you're born again because your eye's been evil. So you can have light in your spirit. You can be looking at evil things and what's going to happen? Your whole body will bring darkness. Therefore the light that's in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness? Because we can let it in through any of our members. We can open the door and yield to the ways of sin. Now another thing that they say is devils cannot possess a Christian they can only oppress them, influence them, but not be in them. And the basic term that people use is they use this term demonic influence. Influence, if you look very closely at their writings, they talk about influence. And when they come, or they'll call it oppressed. And they mean for something from the outside. They don't mean that you can be possessed, that the demons can be within you. And they just make these assumptions. Well. Not so. First of all, there's no, the word influence isn't even in the Bible. You won't find it. They pulled this out of thin air. It's not even the truth. How about possessed? We mentioned the fact, we already talked about this, but we'll bring up two scriptures that show that demons can possess us and be in us. Acts chapter 8, verse 7. Here's where Philip was preaching the gospel in Samaria, preaching Christ to them. They gave one accord to the things that Philip speak, saw, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. And notice what he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. When we put the word possessed, it is the word echo, which means to have, or in a past tense, it would mean being held by them. So, the demons were holding them captive in particular areas, as the, that's why they had bondages, physical or mental or emotional, whatever it might have been. Notice that they came out of them. They didn't come off of them. They just didn't come away from them or flee from them. They came out. If they came out, they were in before they came out. We see Jesus casting the demons out of people. He never cast them off. He didn't cast them away. He cast them out. This shows this clearly. We see another case, Acts chapter 16, showing that possessed refers to demons being in a person. Acts 16, 16. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed, same word, echo, held, with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought our masters much gain by soothsaying. Same followed Paul on us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High, which show unto us, it really means a way of salvation, not the way of salvation in the Greek. This you did many days, and Paul being turned, grieved, turned, and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Again, the demon was possessing this person, and he cast it out. This shows us the fact that demons are within us, and they have to be cast out. One thing we must know, many people will say, well, when you're talking about possessed, you're talking about total ownership. They totally own you or totally control you. No, that's not what demons do. They don't totally control you or own you. They are possessing an area in your life. Example, didn't Jesus cast out deaf spirits out of people? Well, if you have deaf spirits in you, is it totally controlling you? No, but it's stopping you from being able to hear, let's say, in this air. And so you it was have a, a possessing an area of control in some aspect in your life. And when they got cast out, they were able to hear. That shows you they're not totally controlling you but they are in you, and they have to be cast out of you, and they are affecting you in some aspect. They can be affecting you in your mind, in your emotions, in the soulless realm. They can be affecting you in your physical body, and they have to be cast out. They can be doing lots of destructive things. So, the people saying that you're not totally owned, or totally controlled, you know, you're, you're thinking that that's what possessed means, they don't understand what possessed means. Possessed means to be held captive in a particular area in the soul and or in the body and they have to be cast out. Another objection that people bring are, is this, these problems are flesh and not demons. When I was in Portland, Oregon many years ago, there was a woman, she was a pastor, who had been involved with a particular man who was a leader of the Word of Faith movement and she helped in writing the book that he wrote which is an absolute abomination because of an attack against deliverance ministries. 
and this particular one uh, was there when I gave testimony in a full gospel businessman's meeting that I was invited to speak at of all the things that God had done, giving testimony of the works of God being done through the, casting out the demons. She came up to me afterward and said, these aren't demons, this is all works of the flesh. Didn't you read so-and-so's book? Some great guy who was the leader of the Word of Faith movement at that time, he's deceased now. But I said, it's all wrong. It's totally wrong. It is all demons. It's not just flesh problems. Otherwise, the person believed, and many people out there teach this, that these are all flesh problems, not demons. Well, what's the answer? Well, Romans chapter 7 tells us something about what dwells in the flesh. Verse 17, this is where Paul wasn't able to do the things that he wanted to do. Something was going on in him. He says, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And then in verse 18, he said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he's talking about, dwells no good thing. So, sin is dwelling in the flesh. So, what happens when we walk in the flesh? We sin. Well, what happens when we walk in sin? Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not, this is to the church, Christians, to whom, well, that's a personality, you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to him you obey. That's talking about a person. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So that means when we sin, we're yielding to a whom, which is the devil. So when you walk in the flesh, you sin. When you sin, you're yielding to the devil and you actually become a servant of him until you come to the place of repentance, whether you're born again or not. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. This is speaking to the church. The word place is a word topos, which means a place of residence or an inhabited place, because that's what happens. When you sin, you open the door, they will come to dwell on the inside of you. So, the answer is simply this. We have both problems, flesh problems and demonic problems, because when we walk in the flesh, we sin. When we sin, we give place to the devil and allow evil spirits to come in. This is why we've got to deal with both. We've got to deal with the fleshly problems and turn away, put off all the old men, put off all these things, as well as cast out the demons. And we brought this scripture up before, but we'll bring it up again. This scripture clearly shows that we have to deal with both the flesh and the evil spirits. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, this is our responsibility to do this, of what? Of all filthiness, or the uncleanness, the defilement. Well, where is this filthiness? It's of the flesh, it's also of the spirit, modifies of the spirit. Now what's the spirit? It's not talking about your spirit. Is, any, is there any filthiness in the spirit of Christ or in the Holy Spirit? No way. Where is the filthiness? It's the filthiness of the spirit in the soul and the body. And how is that? Through the evil spirits. We see that the term evil spirits is called, referred to as unclean spirits some 18 times in, in Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there in the Gospels, and it reveals the fact that spirits are filthy or unclean. It's a general term for them. So the filthiness of the spirit are evil spirits. This shows us the fact that it isn't just flesh problems, it's flesh problems and demons that have to be cast out. And notice what it goes on and says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That tells you something. If you don't deal with the, not only the flesh problems, but also cast out all the demons, you will never perfect holiness in the fear of God. That means 90% plus of the body of Christ, they'll never perfect holiness in their life. They can think they are, but they're not, until they've not only dealt with the flesh, but cast out the demons. Another objection that people say is, from Matthew chapter 12, this is what they say. Pick up over in verse 25. They say, you cannot have demons within because a house or a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. That's what they say. Well, it sounds like maybe that makes some sense. Look what it says. Verse 25. Jesus knew their thoughts, said unto them, every kingdom divided itself against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And what was he talking about here? 
Remember the Pharisees were saying that Jesus was casting out the demons by Beelzebub, which would be by the devil's power? Basically, the devil working in him was casting out demons. That's essentially what they were saying. And Jesus then says in verse 26, If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? So, what is this talking about? It's not talking about Christians being divided within themselves because of the presence of demons within them. No, it's they have the spirit of Christ in them. The demons are there causing them problems. They're not divided against themselves. The demons are trespassers that have come in, that have got in from open doors of sin or however, and they need to be cast out and driven out. So it doesn't even make sense. It's ta not talking about Christians being divided. It's talking about Satan being divided against Satan. Otherwise, could Satan cast out Satan? No, only Christians would cast out Satan. So it doesn't even make any sense. People haven't even thought. They must have thrown their mind out the window when they were looking at this because it doesn't even make any sense at all. Another objection that people say is you cannot have demons in you because you can't serve two masters. And this is their scripture on that. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, which refers to riches. Well, what does this got to have with demons in us? It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Demons in a person doesn't make you, I'm submitting to them and serving them. I'm not submitting them. I'm not serving them. They're just causing me problems in my life, causing bondages that have to be cast out. Demons are evil spirits that are possessing areas of control in us, causing destructive effects, whether it's in our mind or our emotions, our will, or in our physical body, and they have to be cast out. This has nothing to do with talking about demons within us whatsoever. Another objection is Christians can't have demons within them because a fountain does not send forth sweet and bitter water at or out of the same place. Otherwise, thinking you can't have both within you. In James chapter 3, verse 11, this is where it says, Does a fountain send forth at the, at the same place sweet water and bitter? And that's true, it doesn't. But wait a minute. Where would the sweet water, the good things, come out of? They come out of our spirit. Where would the bitter come from? Does it come from our spirit of Christ and by the Holy Spirit? No. It comes from a soul that's yielding to sin. It's coming from the enemy who would come in, and it would work in us to work to try to get us to do wrong things or from the flesh that has sin dwelling on the inside of it. In fact, it's interesting. It says the previous verse, of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. Well, they're saying you can't have uh, sweet and bitter out of the same place. And so they're thinking that means you can't have demons within you. It's not even talking about that. It's talking about the fact that they had blessing going forth and they also had cursing. So they did have two things, a good thing and a bad thing going out of them. Where's the blessing going out of? It comes from the spirit. Where's the cursing come from? It was coming from the soulish realm. Cursing is coming from the soul and the body, and it should not be operation, in operation. Actually, if anything, this kind of almost shows that you can have demons in you because you're blessing one minute and you're cursing the next minute and you're having yielded to the devil. It's the devil working in a person. Another thing we see. Demons, Christians say, people say that demons can't have Christians in them because of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, all things are new. That means, hey, I don't have any more demons in me. Everything's new. Well, first of all, let's think about it for a moment. Did you get a new soul? Did you get a new body when you got born again? No. So it's not talking about all things because you didn't get a new body or a new soul. Well, they say, well, it's all things in the realm of the spirit, which include demons. They're all gone. Well, where are the demons dwelling? In the soul and the body. So they haven't left there. We already know that. But one thing we need to look at, even to understand this a little bit closer. When we look at this, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. When we put the cursor over the word, I begin to put it over all, if you look in the lower window, and I bring it finally to things, you'll find that there's only one Greek word here. One Greek word for translated all things. Things has been added by the translator. It's not even in the Greek whatsoever. It simply means 
all. Now that makes a little bit of a difference. Also, if you look at how this is actually translated literally, look what Young's is bringing out, essentially. He is saying, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Now he adds the things here, unfortunately. Old things did pass away. Lo become new have all things. Unfortunately, he put the things in there. But things is not in the Greek. It's not in there. This is, this is the word down here in the Greek. This is this word referring to all. And there is not, they, they say all things, but it doesn't mean things. It means all. So the way you would translate this literally from the Greek, if you were looking at it, it would say this. It would say, so that if any in Christ, Christ a new creation, the old did pass away, that's what it says, behold, all have become new. It's not talking about all things. It's talking about all. And so who's it referring to? If any is in Christ, that's the born-again Christian. He's a new creation. Old, what old are we talking about? The old spirit that we had, because what do we get? A brand new spirit. The old spirit is what it's talking about in the context, is passed away. All has become new on the inside of us in our spirit. We get a brand new spirit. Otherwise, there's nothing of the devil in our spirit. It's in our spirit where the change has occurred, not in our soul or body. You can even see it's talking about the context here in back in verse 14. It says here, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Okay, we're all dead how? Spiritually. Talking about our spirit is dead unto God. He that died for all, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Who are the ones that live? The ones who are born again. What do they have? A brand new spirit. Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. We've known Christ after the flesh, but now henceforth know we him no more. Otherwise, how do we know someone? After the spirit. And then he comes down and he says, therefore, talking about what happens in your spirit. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Where? On your spirit. You've got a brand new spirit on the inside of you. Old did pass away, more literally. Behold, all has become new. Talking about in your spirit. Not your soul, not your body. People just try to, take to, try to add that little thing, things in there, and they try to stretch it across to soul and body and sit, sit there and think that, Everything is brand new in our life. Obviously, things aren't brand new in our life. I got the same soul, I got the same body, I can have the same problems, all these kind of things. Again, it is false teaching that people are trying to make a stretch to believe lies. In Matthew chapter 10, we see another one. They say there's no record of demons, excuse me, no record of disciples receiving deliverance. Well, that's not necessarily true. Look what it says. When he sent them forth to minister to the people, Matthew 10, 8, Jesus said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Mm -hmm. Then notice what he says. Freely you have, that's talking about the disciples, received, which is the word lambano, which means to take hold of themselves. That meant they took it to themselves. That means they must have got healed. They must have got the demons cast out of them. Freely give. Otherwise, they did see this come to pass in their life. So this is a scripture that does show that the disciples did have demons cast out of them from what it says. Another one, they say, no record that demons ca were cast out of Christians. Well, again, we go back to Mark, remember? Mark 16, first thing it said, go preach the gospel. Second thing it said, you believe and you get baptized and you're saved. Third thing it says, believers are to cast out demons. And remember, this is not talking about unbelievers or for unbelievers. It's only for believers. This would imply that demons are to be cast out of Christians. We even see some cases where it actually happened, if you look at the progress of what happened in Acts chapter 5. Here's where they went out preaching the gospel. Verse 14 tells you, Believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. Tremendous number of people getting born again. So they're all born again. These people were born again, the multitudes insomuch that they brought forth the sick 
that's from these multitudes that got born again, into the streets, lay them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And there came a multitude out of the cities round about in Jerusalem, remember these are the multitudes that got born again, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed, every one, as the demons were cast out, because casting out demons brings healing. And they were delivered of those evil spirits. These are the ones who were brand new Christians. We also see it if we go back over to where we looked at in Acts chapter 8. Philip preaching Christ at Samaria. So he preaches the gospel. What happens? The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip speak, spake. They got born again. Verse 12 talks about how they got baptized. And then what happened? As they were doing the works of God, casting the demons out, the people were getting delivered, and they were getting healed. The power of God was ministering to them. So again, this shows that Christians who just got born again were being healed and being delivered. So demons were cast out of Christians. Another script point that people bring is, it's not written in the Bible that Christians have demons in them. Well, there isn't a scripture that says Christians have demons in them. But obviously, from 2 Corinthians 7, 1, the scripture we looked at, it implies that demons are in us because of the fact that we're to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, which are the evil spirits that have to be cast out. Also, we already saw in Corinthians about the fact that these guys, in 2 Corinthians 11, he said to them about receiving another spirit. So demons could come into it. They receive another spirit which you've not received. So these spirits can come into a Christian. And so even though it's not written specifically, demons are in Christians. You can see it very clearly. Also, how do demons come in? From open door of sin. Has everybody sinned? Absolutely. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If everybody sinned, that means everybody has demons in them. Everybody has demons in them and needs to cast them out. Another thing that people say is, well, Christians have the Holy Spirit in them and demons can't be in them. They just assume that the Holy Spirit's presence causes demons to not be able to be in us. Again, not so, because where's the Holy Spirit live? In our spirit. Where are the demons? In the soul and the body. They are still in us, and we already gave the Old Testament example on that, of the temple, that shows that they can be in us at the same time the presence of God is in another place. Another objection that people bring is you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and of devils. They'll say this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First of all, we'll read in verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Let's go back for a moment. Verse 20, he says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So he's saying don't have fellowship with devils. Not that they couldn't have fellowship with devils. He said that you would not have fellowship with devils, which they could. And then, of course, he says you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils, telling them the fact that if you have fellowship with the devils, you're not going to be able to partake of the things of the Lord because you're going to be having all these, you're going to be following the way of the devil. That's what he's saying. This has nothing to do with the fact that we can't have demons in us. We can have demons in us, even though we're born again. And then he goes on and says, Do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? What would cause them to be jealous if they were serving idols and letting evil spirits come into them and serving demons? And that would cause them to be jealous. This actually talks about, really, in the, essentially, in, the, in this scripture, in verse 20, it tells us, that we can have fellowship with devils. How do we have fellowship with devils if they come into us and they're, we're work, they're working in our life in some aspect where they were involved in sacrifice to them and worshiping them? Again, this has nothing to do with having, not having demons in a Christian. Another thing that people will say is you can't have demons in you because the greater one is in you on the inside of you. 1 John 4, verse 4. You're of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Say, well, see, the greater one's in you, the devil couldn't come into you. Now, it doesn't say that, they're just making a stretch. But what, one thing you need to look at is, what's the context even talking about? Verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 
Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you've heard that it should come. And even now already is, is it in the world. And you are of God, little children, have overcome them. Who? The false prophets' teachings. The talk, the, them is talking about the false prophets. That's what it's talking about. Because greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. Otherwise, they wouldn't listen to their lies and their false teachings that they were bringing forth. So overcoming the false prophets' false teaching is what it's talking about in the context. So it has nothing to do with keeping demons from coming into you. Again, it's just people trying to stretch, make a stretch and make scriptures say something that they don't say. This is a common practice among people that are against deliverance or against other things. They try to stretch the scriptures and make them say something they don't say. Here's another one. Cannot have demons within because the devil can't touch a Christian who's born again. And they come up with this one. Well, that's not so. Look what it says. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth, this is a present tense verb, doesn't continue on an ongoing basis to sin. But he that's begotten of God keepeth or guards himself, and the wicked one touches him not. So, does this scripture say that the devil can't touch him? No. It says if he keeps himself, the wicked one won't be able to touch him. To take a, a context and say, yeah, the wicked one can't touch you because you're a Christian. Again, this is a classic example, again, of people taking a portion of Scripture out of context and making a statement. Well, the devil cannot touch a Christian. It doesn't say that because he's born of God that a devil can't touch a Christian. It says if he keeps himself, he's got to guard himself so he doesn't give place to the area of sin and allow the evil spirits to come in. Here's another one that people bring up. Colossians 1 13, they say we're already delivered because of Colossians 1, 13, so we don't have any demons in us. Look what it says. Who has delivered us from the authority, this word power is exousia, which means authority of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now we've come in, where has that occurred? Spiritually, we've come into the kingdom. We now are a king under the king of kings, Jesus Christ. We're not under Satan's authority, but that doesn't mean that demons are gone from us, because how do demons come in from sin? You've been born again, you've been delivered from Satan's authority, you're in the kingdom, but can you walk in the ways of sin? Sure you can. What will happen? Evil spirits will come into a person. So this is not talking about the fact that the devil can't touch you or come into you, if that was the case, if that was true, we should have no sickness, no sin, no problems. We should be in perfection again by that rationale, which is crazy. Not true at all. This means we're in the position in the kingdom that now we can do something about the works of the devil and cast them out, as well as resist the devil, speak to mountains, conquer areas in our life, overcome areas of sin and all of these things. We are delivered from under his authority. But nonetheless, we can give place to the devil through sin and also all the spirits that have come into us from inheritance, our own sins, and, and from victimization have not left. We have to cast them out. So again, this is wrong analysis of the word. Galatians chapter 3. Here's another one. This is a common one that you hear. You cannot be cursed and have demons in you because of Galatians 3.13. People say, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, as cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. See? That means he redeemed me from the curse, so I can't be cursed. And demons are enforcing the curse, so that means I can't have any demons in me. That's the logic that people say. That does not mean that we cannot have demons in us or anything of a curse whatsoever. This is talking about what Jesus did so that we could overcome all of the curses in our life. For instance, didn't he redeem us from sin? Yes, he did. Can we sin? Yes, we can. Just because he redeemed us from sin, does that mean now we can't sin? No. He redeemed us from sickness and disease. Does that mean we can't have, be sick? Any, anybody here never been sick in their life? <laughs> no. Ah, sickness can come into us. See, they've misunderstood this. What Jesus did for us in his work 
has accomplished this so that now we can draw, destroy all the works of the enemy. We can break curses, we can conquer sin, we can be healed of sickness and disease, we can be set free from everything. Redeemed from the curse does not mean you can't have a curse. It means now you don't have to have a curse. You can conquer the curse. Not that you can't be cursed, but that you can overcome the curses. Could they overcome the curses before? No. Now we can overcome. Just like we can overcome the devils, we can overcome sickness, we can overcome all of these evil things. Whenever we walk in sin, we will have problems that will come into us in our life. So again, this is again someone not understanding what the scriptures have said. Here's another one, a common one that I've heard, and I've heard this one all over the world, including I heard it over in Africa, even when I was over there. It's amazing how false teachings get all over the place. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. This scripture, to what people have thought, means that you cannot have inherited curses because of Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. And this is what they say. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Can't have a curse. That's what they quote. Again, this is a classic example of lifting something out of context and making a doctrine. I've had people all over the world, all over the United States, when I do seminars, people call me up all the time and bring this up to me. So, what's the answer to it? Let's look at the scripture clearly. Ezekiel 18.20, The soul that sinneth it shall die. It's talking about someone having the effects of their sin, isn't it? The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Then read on. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. What they say is, see, the son cannot bear the iniquity of the father. Well, how would inherited generational things occur? The father's sin would affect the son, come down the line, right? Wait a minute. The next part says, the father cannot bear the iniquity of the, doesn't bear the iniquity of the son. Wait a minute. Do my sins affect my father and do they go upward? No. What came when I was born came from the iniquities of the father. So is this, the inherited generational always comes down, doesn't it? The line. It doesn't go up. So how can you take a con something out of context and make that statement and say it means about inherited generational? And the next statement is going up the line. Does the son's iniquities, you know, come up to the father? No. So is this talking about inherited generational? No. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. They've missed the whole, whole, whole point on it. Furthermore, what does the word bear mean? Bear, you have to look it up in, the, in what it means, and it means to lift. To lift, primarily. So what it's saying is the son shall not lift the iniquity of the father. And the father shall not lift the iniquity of the son. In other words, I can't get the iniquity off of my father, and my father can't get the iniquity off of me. Because I'm responsible for my own sins. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him. Can I get rid of your sins? No. Can you get rid of my sins? No. I got to get rid of my sins. And you got to get rid of your sins. This is not talking about inherited generational. People have missed it unbelievably without really taking a look. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. It is all talking about everybody is responsible for their own sins and you can't get somebody else's sins off of them. If they would have just looked at here and seen the father should not bear the iniquity of the son, well, that can't be inherited generational because it doesn't go up the line. You'd think they'd figure it out. But again, this is deceiving spirits that get into people that they'll, they'll just do anything to try to believe their lying doctrines and make all these false statements. Here's another one. There are seven steps to possession. You know, there's, first there's regression. Then there's repression. Then there's oppression. Then there's depression. Then there's oppression. Then there's obsession. And finally, he gets you with possession. Where'd that come from? Psychology. It's all a bunch of lies. It's also come from many people that have wrote books on inner healing. They, it all is all garbage what they say in there. It's all lies. 
I've read many after many of them, and they all bring all this stuff out. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Is this in the Bible? No, not at all. It's not taught in the Word whatsoever. What happens when you sin? You give place to the devil. The devil comes in immediately. He doesn't have to go through all these steps to finally get into you. You know, before he finally gets you, is he kind of half in and half out, you know? It's ridiculous. Totally contrary to the Word as well. Let's just, let's just show you the one scripture we looked at before to help you. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. If I sin, I yield myself to sin. What have I done? I've yielded to a whom at that point in time. And I became his servant. Why? Because I let the demon come in of open door of sin. That's how I became a servant, in the sense that I was yielding to him. Otherwise, I yielded to the devil immediately. And evil spirits will come in immediately. You mean to tell me from this, what this says, I can go commit fornication, it really won't bring any demons into me because I'm only at the first step. It's nuts. You go commit fornication, they're coming into you right away. That's for sure. It is absolutely amazing that people believe this stuff. I always say, show me, give me chapter and verse showing me your seven steps in all this. It's not in the Bible whatsoever. It's all lies. Amazing how people are so deceived. Even the world out there knows that these things aren't true as far as, you know, the, the demons either in or out, you know, and all this little, these steps and stuff. You know, they don't even really buy this except for people. Some people in psychology do, but yeah, the world even understands this better sometimes than Christians. It's amazing. Another objection. One, you're wanting to blame the devil for everything and use demons as an excuse for why they have so many problems. You know, the old thing that says, the devil made me do it. The devil influenced you, but who did it? You did it. You can't say the devil made me do it. No. We yield to him. Look at what happened over here. Matthew 16, verse 23. This also shows you how a demon will be in a person. This is where Jesus had said in Matthew 16, 21, how he was going to be killed and be raised again the third day. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Was that right or was wrong? Look what Jesus said. He turned and said unto Peter, so he's speaking to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Who's speaking through him? The devil was speaking through him. The devil was operating through him. But how did he get to that place? Because P Peter yielded to him, didn't he? Otherwise, the devil didn't make him do that. Peter yielded to that by not believing what Jesus said and responding out of what the enemy put in his mind instead of believing what Jesus said. And it shows you the devil was in him because he says, get thee behind me, Satan. He said unto Peter. So that shows you that the devil was in Peter. So sit there and say that the devil made me do it. No. You and I have to yield to the devil. The devil will influence you, and he can drive you to do things, but you have to choose to do it. You have a will. You're going to yield yourself to the devil. Another objection that people say is that you have more of an interest in casting out demons and focusing attention on the devil than Jesus. See, I've heard these things for years, and I've read them in books and all this stuff. Absolutely false. When we're casting out demons, where is our focus? On the Word, because the Word tells us to cast out demons. And we're doing it in the name of Jesus, so our focus is on the Lord operating through us to drive the demons out. Another one says, It is illogical for demons to be in your mind, will, emotions, and body. In fact, what they'll say, it's just chemical imbalances in your mind. Or it's just problems in your genes. Or trauma in your emotions. Or sickness in your body. All these little explanations for all this stuff. Through all these things, Whatever kind of thing happened, it let the demons come in. It's demons that are in a person. Look at what happened for this guy. And if anybody was traumatized and all kind of problems in his life, this guy surely was the man from Gadara. 
How did he get free? When the demons were cast out, he was in his right mind. He had been possessed by the devil, had control of him in his life. He had a legion of demons, tremendous amount. The demons cast out, he was set free. How about in the body? Well, these are just problems in your genes or physical problems. This is the world again, and it's amazing that Christians have just believed these things. This is what the world believes. Verse 32, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man possessed with a devil, dumb man. Well, I thought maybe he had a speech problem or something on his brain didn't work, a speech impediment or some way, you know, something happened. Something happened so he couldn't speak. No, he had a demon. When the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. It's pretty clear. If we will cast out the demons, we will get rid of the root cause of the problems and get free. They also say that it's, you know, illogical for anybody to have demons in them. Well, these women, women have been beaten up a lot. Women have been bruised and damaged and hurt. Luke 8, 2 says, Certain women which had been healed of evil spirits. It's not talking about the physical things because the next thing says, and infirmities. That's talking about their sicknesses. Healed of evil spirits. That would be talking about especially in the soul realm, the emotions. That's how you get set free by casting out the spirits until they're all gone. Deliverance brings healing in the soulish realm. Another thing that they say, they say deliverance puts a greater emphasis on the power of Satan to attack us than the power of Christ to keep and protect us. You're always thinking the devil's stronger and he's always going to attack us. Well, first of all, does the devil try to attack us? Absolutely. Anybody been here been under attack of the enemy at any time in your life? Sure you have. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He is out there trying to devour someone. But can we stop his works? Absolutely. We can overcome him. We can resist his temptations. We can walk free so he can't even be able to affect us. We saw that the guy who guarded himself, the wicked one, would touch him not in 1 John 5, 18. So we can overcome the power of Satan, but he does have power, and we've got to do what the Word says. So are we putting emphasis on that? No. We're actually putting the emphasis on God able to deliver us from the enemy's works in our life. Another thing is that people will say, well, the fruit is to bring division to the body of Christ. I had a, pa a pastor that came, or was a minister who came, uh, to our church, and he told me, and when he found out that I ministered deliverance, he, says, he said this to me. He said that, you know, when you're involved in this, you're going to bring division in the body of Christ. I said, well, Jesus said we're supposed to cast out the demons. He said, well, you don't want to try to bring division. Does that mean I compromise on everything? Well, speaking in tongues, should I compromise on that one because that might bring division? Healing, should I compromise on that because some people don't believe in healing for today? <laughs> no. Luke 12, 51. Suppose you that I'm come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. He came to bring division between those that will follow the way of the Lord and those who won't. Those people that follow all of the Word of God, including deliverance, are the ones that are going to follow the way of the Lord wholly, doing everything that He says. So is that the fruit of it? No. What's the fruit of deliverance? Well, Jesus talked about it. Preach deliverance of the captives, brings them free out of, the, out of captivity. Sets at liberty, the same word, release from bondage and imprisonment, those that are bruised. Sets those people that have been bruised and damaged and shattered and hurt and wounded. Seen them be set free from bondages. The real fruit is to bring freedom from captivity and bondage, sickness, disease, all soul realm problems, see people get set free. Another thing, people say, well, your demon, demons are always your center of attention. No, our attention is on the Word in doing the Word in order to see people be set free. In fact, one pastor, he's a nationally known pastor. He has a national TV program. He's had it on for a long, long time. He said in his message, what, quote, I heard it myself and I wrote it down exactly. What would a demon want with a Christian? Saying why Christians couldn't have any, uh, Christians wouldn't have any demons in them. What would a, what would a Christian want, what would a demon want with a Christian? 
That is an unbelievable statement from a pastor who you would think should know the word. Well, what would be the answer to that? What would a demon want with a Christian? Well, here's a good, good example. The demon says, I'll return unto my house. He wants to make you his house. That's what he wants with a Christian. So he can carry out his destructive works. And what else does he want to do? He wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10. How's he going to do that when he comes into you? He's going to do that destructive work. Another one will say, and I've heard this lots of times, well, you're just out of balance, you know. The truth is, when I came into deliverance, God said to me, you were out of balance, but now you've come into balance. Because you got people born again, you got people receiving the Holy Spirit, you were praying for people to be healed and preaching the word and exhorting people to walk in the ways of the word, but you, didn't, you weren't doing anything in deliverance. You didn't know anything about it. You were out of balance. He said, now you've come into balance. And yet, you know, it's interesting. When we were in Ohio, we passed out 120,000 of those good news for you. And we passed them out all over that city. And we, had, we were out constantly preaching the gospel all the time. I never had anybody come to me and say, you're out of balance here because you're preaching the gospel too much. Or we would pray for people to be healed. Oh, you're out of balance because you're praying for people to be healed. Or you're out of balance because you're, you know, having intercession. We had intercession. There was a time we had intercession five days a week for an hour a day. We were interceding continually. We had people that would come. It was close by where we'd come to the church. We had groups of people that were interceding continually. Oh, you're praying too much. And then how about casting out demons? Then all of a sudden when you're casting out demons, now you're, now you're out of balance, they would say. It's ridiculous. Again, this is just people trying to attack trying to say that if you're doing something, they think you're doing it too much. No, oh, we should be witnessing, we should be praying, we should be praising, we should be in the Word, we should be casting out, all of those things. We're not doing anything too much. Now, another thing. People will try to tell you, and I've had people tell people to stay away from me, stay away from our church. I had pastors say, stay away from the church. Don't go around that person. And I had people that would come anyway. They said, my pastor told me not to come. That's what he said. I've had lots of them tell me that. I had a person tell me, one guy that was in a, a particular ministry to the poor, and the guy, he were, there were two guys that were running this ministry. And the one guy was absolutely against deliverance. And the, the other guy, he needed deliverance real bad. And so he came to me because he wanted deliverance. He said, please don't tell so-and-so because he would, you know, we, we probably would have a big fight or whatever. Oh, he didn't want me to know, you know, because he was, didn't want this guy to know that he was coming for deliverance. It's amazing. All these people that do this, they're in trouble. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 says, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out demons. Anybody that tells anybody that they should stay away from casting out demons or a church that casts out demons is absolutely wrong. They are absolutely in error and they are deceived. In fact, they have been deceived by the devil. You know, the scripture even talks about this. 1 Timothy 4.1, the spirit speaks expressly in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing. This is deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. Following after this. Absolutely. We should not do that. Remember what Jesus said. Remember that scripture in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, what Jesus said after they were talking about casting out the demons. He that's not with me is against me. Anybody that says that you shouldn't be involved in casting out demons is against Jesus. It's the truth. That may seem like a hard thing to say, but it absolutely is the truth. Anybody that's objecting to deliverance is deceived and disobedient to the Word of God that clearly says it, and they have followed doctrines of devils, and they'll do anything they can to try to stop people from pursuing deliverance. I've had lots of people that have come in the past 
And then he went back. They came for a deliverance session. We started. The demons were pouring out of him. They went back. And I said, hey, come on in the next time. And they went back and told their pastor. And the pastor got after him and said no, you know, and told them not to do that. And then they wouldn't come back. And that's so, so sad that they would stay in that state. Yet there were so many. So many who said, no, I'm going to obey what God says and do what he says. God wants every one of us to cast out demons. Why? Because we all got them. We all need to get set free. Everybody needs to get set free. We all have a network from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization. So all these lies that come up, if you read information, you read books, you get on people's websites, they'll especially talk about, oh, they're just influencing us or they're still pressing us from the outside. Oh, they aren't in us. They don't think that they're in us. And they always define possession as total control or ownership type of a thing, which is not what it's talking about. They're possessing areas of control affecting us in some aspect in our life. So, again, we see all these lying teachings, and you need to know this so that you are ready to answer the questions that would come against you, bring, bring against you, because they'll try to bring all these things up. And I've been on different people's uh, denominational websites, such as the, I've got my response, I don't have time to go through it, to the Assemblies of God position on believers where they're absolutely against it. Their whole doctrine is speaking against it. All the different things they've, they've brought, it's ridiculous. And people that have re read, written books against it, it's astounding. So I mentioned the guy who was the head of the Word of Faith movement in the United States for many, many years, wrote an attacking book against deliverance. All lies, all lies false. The whole thing is crazy. Absolutely contrary to the scriptures in all these ways. This is going on. And why would the devil fight this? Because does he want anybody to get delivered and set free from bondages? No. What do we see? He doesn't want anybody to get born again. But if you get born again, you know, and once it's fortunate, he doesn't want you to get the Holy Spirit, doesn't want you to get praying in tongues, doesn't want you to start coming to church and reading the word. And growing. You can have all these things, but think about it. The demons in you are still safe. They haven't been driven out yet. All the things from inheritance. You got a bad inheritance line? You could be a Christian for 50 years and doing everything you know to do right, going to every church service, you're doing everything that you know, but you still got all these demons. You got a bad inheritance line, you're in a mess because all those spirits are still in you. Where do we see the most persecuted and the most attacked? ministry or aspect of what we do in our Christian life, where, what's the biggest thing that's attacked? It's deliverance. It's attacked everywhere because that's what is going to get rid of the enemies. The devil doesn't like anything, but once you start casting the demons out, now he's going to lose his house. Now he's going to lose his influence in your life. Now he's not going to be able to carry out the inherited generational curses, how he's killed everybody off with cancer or kill everybody off with heart problems. And now you can get free of it. Or he's had everybody in mental bondages, or he's had everybody in alcohol bondages, or he had everybody in poverty bondages, or had everybody in, in behavioral problems that destroy relationships, anger and all kinds of, you know, can't even function in relationships. It's amazing. Deliverance sets the captives free and brings us out of bondage and spiritual imprisonment. And so, all the false teachings out there, we've got to stand up against them because the truth has to come forth so that we, will not help, we can help other people not to be deceived and be turned away from what the Word says. Remember, the bottom line always comes back to, what does the Word say? Don't listen to anything that anybody tells you if it's contrary to the Word. That's why I always say, give me chapter and verse for what you're saying to me if someone tries to say something. Prove it in the Scriptures. If they can't give you chapter and verse and prove it in the scriptures, then you know there's something wrong. Again, we'll close with the scripture we began with. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils. The most fought against thing in the body of Christ. And what's the second one? Speaking with new tongues is the second most fought. Boy, these guys erased this out of their Bible, I guess. There's a problem. We should believe the Bible and do what it says. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth to answer objections, 
to those who reject deliverance. I see clearly that these objections are not true. They're not according to the word. The people have been deceived. I thank you that I will be able to share the truth with others to help them come out of the line teachings, doctrines of devils that say that Christians don't have demons or to stay away from deliverance. I will never listen to that. It is a lie from the devil. I will speak boldly in line with the word and help them to know the truth so that they will not reject deliverance. I thank you for using me to minister to people that I come in contact with to help them to understand deliverance is necessary for all Christians and it is a good thing. Thank you, Lord, for bringing forth truth so like we can answer all objections. In Jesus' name, amen.